crypto is till this day still being marketed as a get rich quick scheme until crypto finds a proper market fit in terms of what is it going to actually be used for that's not going to change i think it's going to be toxic for a while because i think the next bull run or whenever the next bull run happens it's going to be draw the same exact crap right everybody's going to try to fomo right back into it they're going to try to make all these 100x gains and then people are going to lose money new scams are going to happen before the next bull run here's what you have to know you need to increase your income and decrease your expenses and you need to start growing your savings as soon as you possibly can start putting small chunks of it like three to five percent of that savings dcaing every month or every couple of months or on massive drops just keep doing that for a long period of time be careful this is the biggest mistake people are going to make is they're going to invest too much and then the markets are going to kind of stay stagnant or go down even lower and then rents do and then they're going to start selling their pos uh, position and start capitulating and start taking losses do not make that mistake no, 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 no. all right we're live welcome back another episode we got a special guest and a good friend here seb welcome to the seed phrase podcast we're going to dive right into this uh, a lot of you guys already come from this channel and have probably seen him around on YouTube. He's got over 500K subscribers. His story in short, from immigrant to multimillionaire and what, six years, I think it was? That's the title. So, Oh, yeah, something like that. Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> well, that's that's the first topic. Let's clear that out. So talk to me more about, I guess, if you were to summarize that journey, like how does it feel to be on the other side now? Like what does that feel like now? Um, well, it feels good. <laughs> I mean, it feels nice. It's it's comfortable. Um, it's it's cool going from one side and then being on the other. You get perspectives from both, which I think uh, most people don't get. You know, some people are born in the center and they kind of never get to see either side. But it's it's cool. It's it's a good perspective on life. Um, I think that it ages me, so I feel like I'm a lot older than 23. I feel like I'm an old man sometimes, but it, it's it's cool and it's nice. It's it's comforting. Um, it's definitely a very comforting feeling i would say i would describe it as like secure yeah i honestly i didn't know who you were until we got you on as a guest but i did my research and listening to your journey i was like wow this guy has lived like nine lives like you went from kfc to car salesman to real estate agent to um what was it e-commerce drop shipping and then your google ads agency that's more than what people do in a lifetime which is really impressive that you started in high school doing that. Um, but I'm wondering, like, how do you go from KFC to car salesman? Like, was it just money that was motivating you or did you have a plan? So, OK, well, OK, to answer that question, I was extremely motivated by money. But I, OK, so I was never a car salesman. I sold I flipped cars. So I okay. bought and sold cars myself personally. Um, and I was an auto glass salesman. Um, so I used to sell windshields actually, but going, I, do, I mean, it took a while, so, you know, like I was, I was working KFC when I was in high school. So it, it was, it took a long period of time, but I just essentially saved up all my money and, and I bought those cars and flipped them. And then I saved up that capital and poured it into e-com. Um, and then that money grew and then I started YouTube and I started all the other ventures and, you know, failures obviously along the way, but, uh, I just kept growing the money until I started investing it into like, uh, I, well, I flipped a house and then uh, crypto and stuff like that. And then it just, you know, keep growing. Keep yeah. Growing, keep like growing. you, yeah. me, Mo, we're all immigrants and we come from immigrant families. And like, I had to learn financial literacy on my own. I didn't learn it in school. I didn't learn it from my family. And I'm sure that's the same with you. Um, so I'm wondering like back then, put yourself back into high school, Seb. Who were you listening to or where were you getting information from that was leading you down this path? Oh man, that's a that's a really good 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 question. Yeah. I don't I never really followed one specific person. I would say the first influential person I ever listened to was Graham Stephan uh in high school. He really kind of helped me uh understand like okay, this is kind of what I want to do. I read books in high school as well, but for, from the most part, most of like my knowledge came from my mom and she just taught me what I shouldn't do. Right. Because mm -hmm. I saw the way she was like doing her finance and I was like, OK, I should not be doing this. Um, I remember there's one thing. It's so funny and it's just a habit. So she she likes things that are on sale. So she'll buy like especially food. So she'll buy food that's on sale uh, because I don't know. She'll buy a lot of it, too. 
uh, and then she'll like store it in the freezer and then we'll never eat it. So, <laughs> and then like, like six, seven months, eight months later, like we'll toss it because I'm not going to eat it and she's not going to eat it. Right. But then she'll do it again. And I remember one specific time she came home with like, <laughs> she came home with like 14 pineapples. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I had an American girlfriend at the time who had no idea, like, you know, <laughs> so I brought her and she's like, why do you guys have 14 pineapples? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, dude, <laughs> I don't even. We're going to start selling them. <laughs> That's funny. My mom is actually very similar to that. My mom's thing is coupons. She's like big on magazine oh, and dude. coupons. And she's so good at it. Like she'll literally sit for an hours at a time and cut up these newspapers, go back, like go to the grocery store, come back, tell my dad, guess how much I spent on all this? And he'd be like, 300, 400. She'd be like, nope, $80. And he'd be like, what the fuck? Like, how is that even possible? They get a high from it, man. It's crazy. Yeah, my mom had a binder with coupons. She would take it everywhere. So, like, <laughs> yeah. if we were going out to Wendy's, she'd open a binder and look yeah, for coupons. Yeah. And there was, like, Literally. five people behind us. And I'm like, mom. <laughs> She's like, hold on. I got it somewhere here. I got to find it. <laughs> Literally, bro. So you can imagine how that was. But I was like, you know, growing up around that, I was like, I got to get rich. Like, yeah. I'm not, I can't do this. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Let me ask you this. So going into the current world circumstances that we have now, right? I think a lot of people are, one, never experienced the situation. Two, are very confused how to act moving forward, right? It's like there's so much uncertainty. I want to reverse back on that question. It's like, what is one thing that you remember hit you really hard, like a failure that you'll never forget? And you're like, okay, I never want to go through this again. So now I know how to act moving forward. Okay. Do you mean like a, like a loss of money, like a financial failure? Financial, or it could just be like a mindset thing, right? It's like, Hey, back then when I had a lot of money or, or I was trying to make a lot of money, I was thinking this way and I stopped thinking this way. That's allowed me to prosper. Okay. Um, okay. So let me give you both. So mindset wise, when I was 19, um, I had just made like my first, like I had multiple six figures in liquid liquid. Like I was like, cool. Like I could pretty much buy anything a 19 year old would want. I had my GTR. My mindset back then was I want attention. I want a Lambo. I want girls, you know, like I want to do like, I want very materialistic stuff. Um, and I think that unless you're a very, very, no offense, I think unless you're a very, very narcissistic, that is only going to last so long that's only going to be enough fuel to get you so far because those things like you can you can try to attach as much meaning as you can to those but ultimately i think if everyone's being honest with themselves deep down you know that it doesn't matter and even you know some people it takes having to have it all you know they'll get it they'll have a richard million a lambo and they'll be like all right well like all right now what but deep down you know like it's not what life's about and i think that switching my mindset over from just wanting materialistic stuff to um, basically I'm, I want to make money because people rely on me. People depend on me and I need to be like, I need to be a rock, like a foundation for them. Um, like I need to basically the idea is like, I want to support my mom. I want to give it away. I have a family I want to support. I have my, my girlfriend's family. I want to support. I want to donate. Like I have, it's other people's money. It's not my money. It's I'm not selfishly doing it. That is unlimited motivation for me. That's like, a source it's like energy from the sun like i'll never stop so that's one thing mindset wise um biggest failure financial wise i this year actually and i haven't talked about this and i'm not going to give details this year i actually made a five hundred thousand dollar mistake and that's five hundred thousand dollars liquid that i am that i am less i have less in my bank so <laughs> i uh yeah so it was very very, very stressful. <laughs> what asset class? Let me just ask you that. Crypto. Yeah. So, <laughs> there not you surprised. Go. I'm honestly not surprised. It's, it's, it is, it is what it is. Um, but I, I definitely learned one very important lesson. So, and that is to not be, not be too risky. Don't be too risky. <laughs> I've Sorry. definitely been in that situation. No. So let me ask you, uh, so obviously that was a pretty hefty loss. Half a million is obviously no joke for anyone. Uh, so how do you like would bounce back from failure and, and going forward? What is your method method approach that just you know, allows you to just keep moving forward and building so you can put that behind you? Well, 
dude yeah it's so tough man i um obviously like my close friends kind of knew about it and like they would ask me and like kind of you know like for the first like four weeks i couldn't even like i wouldn't even don't even say anything don't even mention it but i would kind of like internalize it and i would just think about it it's like there's really nothing i can do um i just have to put one step in front of the next no matter how like i, w- I would think about it as if i'm like running and like i just like fell like something i don't know and i just like broke like my ankle like there's really nothing i can do like, i just have to get up and keep going um i know eventually i'm going to make the money back i know eventually when i'm you know 50 or whatever or even 30 500k will not mean as much it'll be like less significant to me so i just try to keep that in mind and not not let it consume so much of my everyday basis so i can focus on making it back and and so yeah yeah i think um for a lot of people listening that sounds insane because the average person doesn't have five hundred thousand, let alone five hundred thousand to lose um like what you see in crypto is a lot of people put their life savings their retirement into these investments and they overnight it disappears and people are devastated there is a huge i think from my opinion crisis of mental health especially in the crypto and nft community Um, Because you're online all the time, you're checking charts, you're day trading, you're losing money that you can't afford to lose. Um, And for lack of a better word, you and Mo are whales, right? Like you're pretty much whales in the space, or some people would consider you guys whales. Um, What do you guys see as the culture in crypto, like for men specifically? Like, do you see it changing and becoming more of like a healthy community or do you see it staying in this like toxic like get rich quick like degen culture mo do you want to go first yeah i can go first i think the obvious or let me not the obvious i think eight months ago it was pretty obvious a lot of people were just coming in to get a feel of the simulation right they were just trying to get a feel of like Everybody's making all this money. How can I make money? And some people were making it and losing it. Some people were losing more than they can handle, right? And that obviously, like any other brand new industry or boom, is always going to draw the the wrong crowds, right? And we've talked about this topic before. It's like crypto is, till this day, still being marketed as a get-rich-quick scheme. The whole industry is. The technology Bitcoin, it's all getting marketed. Like anywhere you go, it's like, here's how you can make 10X with crypto, right? Here's why crypto will make you rich. So I think until that narrative changes, and like we talked about before, is like until crypto finds a proper market fit in terms of what is it going to actually be used for, that's not going to change. So to answer your question, I think it's going to be toxic for a while because I think the next bull run or whenever the next bull run happens it's going to be draw the same exact crowd, right? Everybody's going to try to FOMO right back into it. They're going to try to make all these hundred X gains and, and new layer ones or layer twos or these cryptos or whatever the case may be. And then people are going to lose money. New scams are going to happen until again, crypto really finds its fit in the world and, and f- the fit of like, Hey, what problem am I going to solve? And how am I going to disrupt the actual financial system? You know, real estate s- subscriptions, web two, whatever the case may be. I uh I completely agree with Mo. I was I was actually gonna say the exact same thing. It's just when something is a get rich quick type thing, it's gonna attract those types of people. It's gonna attract the sensitive people that just want to get rich, and if they don't get rich, then they like go violent on each other. Um, <laughs> but as the as the the technology matures, because it is new, relatively speaking. Um, it is pretty new and uh, the space is new and once it matures and it's used more commonly, you know, between the average person and stuff and it's not as volatile, you know, Bitcoin has a more stable price. I think that obviously it will be a much better, obviously, it, eventually it will be much better. Yeah. Instead, let me ask you this, I guess, more related to agency or e-com, right? Like, where do you think Web3 is going to fit in the Web2 world? Like for e-commerce? How how do people or brands start kind of like prepping for that? Um, I I don't know how you could start prepping for it. I think that we're gonna see very crazy things that are hard to even predict. 
I, I, I'm saying this based off one company I know in Web3 right now uh, that is trying to integrate with Shopify in Web2. And I think it's called Trispace.io. Um, one of my friends invested, he seed, he, he, invest, he seed funded it. But it's a company that basically like you would put it, it's an application that you put on your store uh, and it would create a, a, a virtual store in the metaverse where you could walk around uh, and design the store however you like. So you could design like like a Dior store or whatever and you could see all the products. So for any store, like let's say, you know, North Face, um, and then you could click on something that you like and like try it on and see it and then buy it right in the metaverse. So I think stuff like that is coming. You know, that's a company that I think, wait, I think I actually even have equity in it too, actually, I think. But <laughs> I, I think like we'll, we'll see stuff like that where you, you can't even predict it. Like that's crazy. But, you know, once you have people chilling in the metaverse and that's more normal, people on these, you know, in there all day, if that's going to happen, um, being able to like design a store and walk through it and like let your customers walk through it you know i don't know that's probably the future it's crazy yeah i'm, I'm curious to see like how the the ad space specifically is going to get impacted because just like obviously over the last five years alone like we've just seen like all these big corporations fight for obviously ad revenue specifically and really hammer down on all these new ways of like spending money so i'm just curious to see like how the quote-unquote metaverse and if if it's only going to be one or the biggest one is going to be facebook then how is that going to affect, you know, the way businesses are generating revenue? Yeah, dude. And honestly, I wish I wish I was smart enough to answer that question better. Um, and I wish I had a good answer for you, but I, I just don't think I do. <laughs> <laughs> I also th I also yeah. think we don't really know where the space is going in terms of crypto. I think we're just, you know, Web3, we're the tip of the iceberg. So to see where like e-commerce is going to be integrated with, you know, Web3 and crypto and blockchain, I think, you know, we're a bit of ways away. And for the reason of, you know, I feel like, you know, people don't want to take that step to be that pioneer, to be the one that's like, okay, I'm going to be the one that just integrates this into the current system. So I feel like it's just going to be one of those things where it just happens all at once. The floodgates will open and then you'll just see all these people to start, you know, hopping onto the train. But, you know, like I said, we don't really have a clear indicator of how this space is going to look like. So I feel like, you know, we're, we're a bit of ways away. Um, yeah. And going off that, yeah. I kind of wanted to touch you on you, Seb. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. But I was going to say, so you've been doing YouTube since 2017 and, uh, you know, obviously you have quite a substantial uh, amount of following and you provide really good content, very good quality content. How long did it take you to get your breakthrough and, and what did you feel that you did that allowed that to happen? Okay, so there was two or three phases to YouTube. There was like zero to 30K subs and then 30K to 100K subs. And then 100k to where i am now which is 560 something um at first it was just content um the the first video that helped me get to like get past 30k and like really start growing i needed to post like an evergreen viral video and that was 991 in 14 hours and that was like ranked number one for shopify so that's how i did it is i was ranking for high volume search terms and drop shipping was really trending at the time so i was ranking for the sh uh, term drop shipping um by design and then from 100 i took a break but i you know i got past 150k and then i chilled at like 200k forever and then i started posting and i i, I worked my way up to like 300k after like some videos and then i like jumped from 300 to like almost 600 now like it'll be 600 soon um the difference is i'm i'm putting a lot of time and attention into youtube and treating it like an actual business whereas i never have um and i learned that there actually is a better way to make videos and there is a better way to get your video videos out in front of more people. And there is a better way to retain people and to get people to like you and also to get people to come back and subscribe to you. So there's a lot of things I learned this year alone. And I just, after putting a lot of attention into them, um, like into those videos, um, I don't know if you've ever seen my old videos versus my new ones. They're a lot different. They're a lot more like designed, um, but yeah, for on, on specific per on for, for for specific reason, um, but yeah, just being consistent with it and um, and learning about the platform and learning about what people want to see and learning about the audience and giving them that I think is what really helped me like push to the higher level. Yeah, totally. I mean, speaking of your videos, 
You have one really interesting one. Um, it's about your goal to make 10 million with crypto this year. So I'm just following up and asking you how that's going. <laughs> so not, yeah, no, not, I won't, not this year. Um, in the next two to three years, I will. Um, and actually the video I'm posting in two days is about that as well. Oh, sure. um, but yeah, it's a very, it's a very, very simple strategy. I'm going to take, I'm going to start with a couple hundred thousand dollars, which eventually is going to be probably like a, like maybe one to two million in. Um, and I'm just going to DCA into very low risk cryptos, uh, like like the top dogs like ETH, um, like uh, the Cosmo eco, eco chain, like uh, GMX, mm -hmm. like that kind of stuff. Um, I'm going to just DCA into them over the next 20 to 30 months. Um, and then once everyone stops talking about crypto and we find like a bottom and like I start to notice this little stuff because I'll be paying attention. I did last time as well. My friends will start hitting me up and be like, yo, it's about to happen again. Um, I'll just throw in like another 300K into high risk alts, uh, just like literally like slot machine. And then I'll just wait. I'll wait like a year and then that'll be like 10 million liquid for sure. And I like you have like a slot machine. Yeah. A lot of a lot of people like to act like it's not right like they just like oh no i'm very aware of exactly what i'm investing in like it's not based well, on speculation people people like to people say that because they like to feel smart and they want to be intelligent but it's i think it's a better i think it's a better move if you just admit that you're not smart and you just you play you play the game that you're playing it's like just play the game you know yeah 100 percent. it's funny because it's like going back to what we were just talking about right like we all look at crypto in terms of like one way or another it's a gambling, <laughs> it's yeah. a gambling place to say hey i have money there's opportunity i think if i just throw some shit at the dart i might just hit big and a lot of people are hitting so what's stopping you from doing it sorry i was curious because like obviously 10 million dollars that's a that's a obviously big goal like you know I believe you could definitely do it, you know, putting into these like high risk alts, obviously safe alt, alts, you know, it's definitely, it makes sense in the next bull market. You know, you could see these returns. Do you have a specific like price action? Like you say, okay, at this price point, like a two, three X, like I'm going to take profit or do you expect it to like go to 10 X and that's like your decide to take profit or do you have like a, like, so my question is, do you have like a specific like number where you're like, okay, and move this much. And this is where I, I start like taking some money off the table. So it depends on the, the currency for the low risk stuff. I'm going to be a lot more patient. Um, if I'm, if I'm gambling, I'm going to take it out. If I win big, I'm going to take it out. Um, and I'm, man, that's, see, that's my problem. This bull market I bought, I spent a hundred grand in December of 19 or the literally the December right before everything happened. Yeah. So, and, and like that year, like I, that was turning into a lot of money. And I sold so early, like I, I was selling on the way up, but I ran out and I sold so freaking early, bro. And that was like my, one of my biggest lessons was I need to just wait because I, I, I definitely under, um, under guessed or underestimated how much hype it came into the space. And the next time around, it will be even more. It is every single time. Yeah. So I need to just slowly build my position now for the next couple of years. And then I'm going to wait for, in terms of ETH, probably like I'm looking at like 10, 10 to 15,000 plus. I won't sell a single penny of it unless it's around there yeah. um, for ETH. And then like the high risk stuff, like, I mean, dude, it's so hard because some, of, some of them pop off and then like, they, like those people make gains and they talk about it and then it pops off again and then it pops off again and you just don't know where like it, the narrative is going to die. But if I do like a, like a five to 10 X on those high risk, high risk stuff, you know, like let's say I put like 10 K into each and I, and it's worth like 50 to hundred K like I probably just close that position, but it sucks because we all know that that could like, there is a rare case where that could have been like a million bucks. <laughs> so, Literally 10,000 turned into a million dollars and we've seen so literally of that yeah it's not it's not even surprising it's like you can totally believe that yeah i remember like especially when it was like shit coin season like last bull run like there was like we i'd be in these group chats and like they literally have like five coins a day going from like hundred thousand dollar market cap to like 
three mil, four mil, and that's like 20X, 10X. Like you throw $1,000 and you turn it into 25,000. So I can't even imagine like that same thing happening with more people trying to come into the yeah. casino in the next bull run. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but I think the problem is people in crypto don't know how to take profits is what we've learned. Um, I'd rather take profit and then see that I lost out on more money than holding forever and going down to the bottom. Like that's the biggest lesson probably most people had to learn the hard way um, in these last few months. But I want to switch gears a little bit. Um, I want to ask you guys something maybe a little bit controversial, but you know, you're all men. You're all working to be successful. You are there successful. You care about money. You care about nice things, but you also care about providing for people, doing general good as well. And there, and YouTube specifically, YouTube is 70% male audience, right? That's just a fact. Um, what do you think about Cobra Tate? Do you like do you like that kind of narrative that he's put into young guys brains like do you think that's productive or do you think that's toxic because obviously i think it's toxic but what do you guys think because you're much more in that space than i am Sam, go first okay <laughs> i love this question all right so you said the narrative that he's putting out so let me yeah. let's be Let's be clear here. What do yeah. you mean by that? Okay, so th this is my interpretation of what Cobra Tate puts out on social media. He's basically like, you're a fucking loser. You're poor. You're not working hard enough. And it's not going to be easy. Pull yourself by the bootstraps and stop being a dumbass. Like, that's the message I get from him. And I'm like, okay, okay. point taken. Work hard. Yes, that's important. Pull yourself by the bootstraps. That's important. It's not going to be easy. That's also important to know. But why not put that message like coming from a place of love rather than like a place of hate, like self hate? Like, you know what I mean? Okay. Okay. So essentially, you're saying his narrative is very abrasive to young men, it's very aggressive uh, and a little bit toxic. And maybe it, it could be. Uh, have like a negative influence to their right. mental health or something. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. I understand. All right. Well, here's the first thing you have to understand about men. Men are <laughs> motivated by challenge. Women are not motivated and, and they do not get much from a challenge. So when you, when you want a guy to do something, you have to challenge him and you don't do that for a, for a girl. If you want a girl to feel love and like, if you want her to do something more, you praise her. So you compliment her and show her love. But for men, you have to be like, you need like do it now. Like if you're lifting a weight, you're not gonna be like, you can like, you look so good. You look so strong. You're like, do it now. You're a pussy. Like you're a bitch. Like do it now. So that's the difference between men is we get motivated from challenge and women get motivated from praise. That's the first thing. And so what Tate, what Tate does, and let me, let me say this. I know Tate. I know him in person. So I bought him dinner. I met him in London. Um, Tate is on purpose playing a character that's very, very aggressive and controversial um, to do exactly what he did. And that was to blow up and, and yeah. do all sorts of stuff. So mm -hmm. it, him as an actual person, he's actually genuinely a very, very kind person. He's a very nice person. Um, I know people that are closer with him and I've only ever heard good about him. Now, let me, let me also say this. I think the reason he's blowing up is because this is the other side that men have been itching for for a long time. So there has been a feminist movement and the girls have kind of like shit on the guys for a long period of time. And now this is the other side. It's a pendulum swing and this is a way over correction where guys are finally being like, okay, you know what? Like I, I have to stick up for myself. I have power like city boy, city boy type vibe. So I think that's why it's so easy to like listen to Tate because when guys listen to him, um, and I've known about him for years and years. I've known him for a very long time. Um, when guys listen to him, they feel like a fire turn on inside of them um, because of the way that he is. And, and ultimately, I think that to answer your question, I think that it was a net positive for men. I think that when people watch Tate, they get up, they go to the gym, they work hard, they put the snack down, um, they do something because Tate is a very challenging person. Um, and that is good for men. Now he has some, he does say some stuff about women, um, like how he wants multiple wives and he, you know, women, he doesn't have to be loyal to girls, um, and girls have to be loyal to him. 
that's whatever. I don't, I don't care. You can, I don't want to, I don't care to discuss that. I'm personally, I'm Christian. So I'm going to have one wife and I'm going to have kids. So that, those are my viewpoints. So, you know, what you know what I believe in. Um, so I don't, I don't care. Do I think that's right? No, I don't. Cause I'm a Christian. So, but, but yeah, I think his, his narrative, like what he says um, for the most part is very, very abrasive and it's very cold, um, but there is truth to it. And that's why you, you do find yourself having a hard time disagreeing with his actual point. Um, if you were to take out how he says it, his actual point, you'd be like, you know what? He actually kind of has a point. And yeah. um, that's actually most of the girls I met. They're like, he's such an asshole, but he's right. Like <laughs> that's how, how it goes. So that's how I feel about it. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree more with what Seb said. There's a there's a quote that comes to mind by uh, Ozan Nova, I think his name is, and it says, "If you stick to the expected, or uh, if you stick to the familiar, you won't find the unexpected, right?" And if like you dig deeper into the main message that Tate is sending, he's not saying anything new. It's not like new ideas or ideology that he just invented, right? He's just going back in time and he's saying, hey, before this soft ass shit that just started coming up and the feminism movement and the equal rights and blah, 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 whatever all these different, you know, movements are, this was how life was. Like, this is how life was. This is how men were. This is how they were thought of. And the idea of a perfect man has changed now because you have all these different circumstances. So like his main message I think, again, is very clear. It's just, yeah, like the way he markets it, right? He has to stay controversial, obnoxious. That may sound like, hey, he's one side one side or the other in order to get to where he is. And okay, I think okay. he does that. Right. Let me, let me try and I have, he, go ahead. Go ahead. He, needs to, he needs to get his point across, right? He needs to get his point across. <clears throat> and being, you know, controversial will draw the spotlight to him. But I, I think it's, you know, it's a double-edged sword. Some of the stuff he says, I, I heavily disagree with. And then some of the stuff he says, I completely agree with, you know, stuff like, you know, a man needs to be providing, a man needs to be able to reach success and not confine to the societal norms and, and achieve greatness. And I think that's really uh, undervalued in our society is that people are just not striving for greatness anymore. And being able to believe in yourself to achieve all this great, great wealth and, and possibility is so important. And I feel like it's giving almost people hope now hearing it from such a you know source that is, you know, you see it all over the internet, people reposting it. So I think it's almost inspiring for men and young men coming up saying, oh, wow, now there's, there's other ways to do it than what the system is currently portraying. I can achieve wealth. Instead of doing a nine to five job, going to college, getting a degree, going to work a nine to five job, working your whole life. And at 65 years old, you're going to retire. And then what, you have 10 years to like have a good life, but you're by then old. And then you're going to die in 10 years. So you have, you're going to work 40 years of your life to have 10 years of freedom. That sounds miserable. That's imprisonment. That's literally societal. Okay, okay, okay. And, and, I, and I feel like Andrew Tate, he, he, he really like allows people to be like, okay, there's other ways to beat the system and to achieve success without, you know, working 50 years like a slave and hating your life. And that's what I take from Okay, him. I agree. But there is tremendous pressure on men to be successful and make money as it is, right? That's not, that hasn't gone away with feminism. If anything, women are like, pay for all the dates, not just the first one. <laughs> like, come on. Like, the reality. It hasn't, it hasn't brought the challenge down to men. It's just changed the way girls think about men. Like, now, instead of girls looking at men for security, safety, long jeopardy, they look at men, and again, not all women, but a lot of women now, the way society is, is they're looking at men as a bank, right? Like, hey, I need to find a guy that has money in order for me to get the lifestyle that I want out of him and nothing else, right? I think that's like one of the main ideas that's been lingering around. And that's why like when Tate comes out and he's like, yo, as a girl, this is how you should be and this is how you should think. It's like a big shock. Wait, you're saying what? You know? So I think that's the way yeah, I look at it. But this is what I was that going works. to say. I make content for Pudgy Penguins, right? And it's all about mental health, awareness, positivity, mindfulness. One of like a video that I made is about the suicide rate. And in men, it's double that of women. Men are twice as likely to die by suicide than women are. 
So what I'm saying yeah. is like, you guys say like, oh, there's such a soft narrative. Is there? Because I feel like most men don't feel like they can talk to someone. Most men don't take care of the men their mental health. Most men feel isolated. Most men feel like there's already so much pressure on them, like to be the provider, to be the breadwinner, to be successful. Like, that's all I'm saying. I don't think I don't think most men have that pressure. Like, I don't think the average man has that pressure to be a provider and to be all of that. Um, I think men are extremely lonely. And I think the 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 dating the dating world is shifting a lot where uh, women are expecting to date much higher out of their league uh, than than men. And it's not as equal as it used to be before. Like before, without social media, you'd have a girl that, you know, like you, you have like an like an average girl today that will get more attention from guys than a princess did like back then. Um, so I think that level of attention is new and it's kind of like messing with our brain a little bit here. And, um, and also it's just social media. It's like, it's, it's a huge comparison game, especially for girls. Like yeah. what it does, what it brings out in women is putting the spotlight on themselves because ultimately what women do want is attention. Um, that's like what they, they look for. They want to get attention and they want to look good and they want to be beautiful. So I think that it, it shifted the dating markets and I think it leaves men very lonely. And that's why there's a very high suicide rate. And life is hard for a guy. It is. It's tough um, because there's nobody. You have no unconditional love like you do as a girl. Like as a girl, you're always going to get attention. Even if you're not a good looking girl, you can still get love and attention from society. Yeah, or if you're a child because you're innocent and, you know, you you can't help yourself. But if you're a guy, it's not like that. If you're a guy, you're, you're expected to be able to carry yourself through life. And if you do not, then no then like you're a waste of space, like go die, like no one cares about you. So yeah, the suicide rate is higher. And I think that's the major reason it is. And I do I do want to touch on one other point. Um, I think that men have become more feminized. And and see, the thing is, it's it's an overcorrection, again, because like in 1950, when we were going to war, I think that men in general lacked um, some fe like some necessary feminine elements in them. Um, and then like the feminist movement happened and now you have guys and they're overly feminized and like that, there's nothing more repulsive. You can't, you can't disagree. There's nothing more repulsive than no, I agree. Just like a soft, you know, like a, like a, oh, like who are you guys talking about? Like all oh, gossiping, that, <laughs> that's the dude, you know what I mean? Like you don't want that. You'll, you'll puke everywhere. So what happens is I think that, I think that girls test guys and I think that girls try to feminize men and they do this subconsciously so that they can so that they, they can see the man deny the t or like uh what's it called like prove that he's not so like that's why girls will try to get things to uh try to get guys to do things that are feminine um and then like if the guys do them they're like let down like it's like oh you should like wear a dress like how do you feel about that like no i'm not gonna do that and like well why it's just like you can express yourself and it's like no i'm gonna stand my ground i don't think it's whatever that's just an example it's a bad one yeah. but my point and why i'm saying that is because Tate is also very big on masculinity, but it's mm -hmm. also an overcorrection. He's like uber, super duper masculine. And obviously not every guy is going to do that. Like not every guy is a professional world champion kickboxer in great shape, you know, billionaire Bugatti. But, you know, the kids listening to him that are 18, like maybe they listen to him, they'll look up to him and maybe they'll start going to the gym. Maybe they'll start like working, get, just becoming a little bit more masculine. And I think that's, desperately needed i think we do need masculine men so i think yeah so yeah but I, that was my last point on that and i i'm done talking about it now i, I, I want to build i want to <laughs> yeah. build on that you know build, build on that doing more you know do that building more because you know you know obviously you said you didn't finish college and you know people are so ingrained oh, i got to go to college you know then get a job nine to five and you clearly show that the system is broken and the education system doesn't pe teach people how to reach success and become financially independent you know, the education system doesn't teach you about taxes, how to start a business. They teach you how to be compliant and a good employee. And you clearly show by, you know, through yep. e-commerce, YouTube, that there's other ways to do it. And you could be young and achieve great success. You know, obviously, you've done very well for yourself at a young age and you're still, you know, I'm sure going to do very well in the future. So you just clearly show that, you know, these critical skills are not taught and there's other ways to be around the system. And going back to our friend Tate is that, Andrew Tate is that there's other ways to achieve success. And obviously you clearly show that with through your work. Yeah. And it's, it's only getting, it's only getting more and more obvious. I feel like with college, I think that it's the biggest scam of our century. Um, I, I think it's completely ridiculous because people, 
people, they're getting over time. It's a slow burn. People are getting comfortable with being in debt. And yeah. so the colleges see this and they're like, oh, right. You know, light bulb. If people are cool being in debt, like, how about we just get you loans to pay for your college? Like what? And, and for what? Like, what? where's the value? Where's the value? 60,000 a year for what? Like I'm lear- like it's I'm learning something. And I, I feel like it's a bubble that's eventually going to pop. Um, because you have YouTube now and you can learn just about anything on YouTube. So like, it's just so, it's so dumb. Cause you're even, you're even being taught most of the times by people that have no experience in the field. Like if you wanted to be a surgeon, which is like why people would use the argument, you should go to college, like to be a doctor, would it not make more sense to like take a course online that was designed in, and specifically designed, designed by doctors and then go and work with doctors and like, like shadow doctors and learn that. For, for four or five years and get the whole thing done in like six years, not 12. But the thing is, is they want it to be slow. They want it to be long because the longer you're there, the more money they're going to make off you. And it's, it's absolutely completely ridiculous. Now, if you're going to college just because you want an income and you don't have like a, you don't think you have a passion about anything because most people think they do, but they, whatever. Um, then it's like the scam, like it, it compounds and multiplies times 10. Um, like, absolutely. I don't even know why you're wasting your time. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a million different ways you can do it. And, and they're, I I don't know if they're doing this on purpose or if it's just by coincidence that people don't believe that it's possible because they were never taught that and never raised that. But I can tell you, um, it's, it's very much so a realistic thing. I've made a hundred K in a day profit multiple times. And like doing that is, is just like, it really shows you how, how crazy this world is and that's nothing like i'm i'm saying that but that's nothing i've seen people do much more i have a friend younger than me that made 11 million dollars in a month profit and he's he's 22 years old and he's younger than me and he uh, was he was broke i went to seventh grade with him just a just a really smart kid so it's like i see this shit around me bro like i i have kids damning me making 50k a day on ecom like i see this all day long people send me screenshots people send me proof they want to prove themselves I see it all day long. It's it's so possible and it's just crazy that it's so contained, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely not as uh well, a lot of people don't think it's possible. That's why. And it's because obviously college, right? Like college makes it seem it's not possible and that you have to take this specific route. Which is like I remember my first interaction ever, like, was probably either Ty Lopez or like Tony Robbins, like before coming into entrepreneurship, like straight up, like what seven years ago maybe. And I was like just graduating high school and I'm like, dude, there's no fucking way I'm doing this again. Like I had just came from Syria, right? Sophomore year. And I went through three years of like high school and I fucking hated it. And I'm like, dude, like back home, my dad had a butcher shop. Like I was fucking working, right? I was like killing cows, sheep, moving things around, hustling in school, like selling shit. And I'm like, bro, there's no way I'm doing more school. And that's when like things clicked up. Okay, Tyler was, oh, you can make money online oh wow like that's a thing and that's like the spark right and that's where ever since then i'm like college yeah one year in i'm like hell no take me out i'm going full time like figure it out let me, you. Uh, let me ask you this uh, so i know you gotta leave pretty soon here you on your youtube right obviously well it's it's not a secret you've made a pretty good amount of money in in crypto during the last bull run right and if you were to give people a lesson or three things to prepare for before the next bull run in order for them to position themselves in the same opportunity that you did. Cause I'll be honest, like I think one of the first videos I watched from you, at least crypto related was something about like flipping NFTs, right? I think it was you and Brett flipping NFT strategy. And I was like, dude, I got to get in this. Right. And I came into the space like pretty late, but I was still able to clear a pretty good amount of money. Yeah. So, what, what would you leave like our audience or people with in terms of like, hey, before the next bull run, here's what you have to know. Yeah, man, absolutely. So it's funny. Actually, the video I'm posting on Friday is exactly that. So I'll, I'll just summarize that video because it's what I believe. Um, and then also, if you guys are listening to this right now and it's if you're listening to it, whatever, you probably go watch that video uh, for a more detailed explanation. But essentially, it's extremely simple. Here's exactly what you need to do. You need to increase your income and decrease your expenses. You need to start growing your savings. You need to start saving more and more money. And then as soon as you possibly can, obviously it's all relative. The more you can do it, the better. As soon as you possibly can start putting small chunks of it, like three to 5% of that savings 
uh, DCAing every month or every couple of months or on, on massive drops. Like there was a massive drop like the other day, I bought in like five, 6%. So just keep doing that for a long period of time until it comes back. Um, and you want be careful. This is the biggest mistake people are going to make is they're going to invest too much. And then the markets are going to kind of stay stagnant or go down even lower and then rents do. And then they're going to start selling their uh, position and start capitulating and start taking losses. Do not make that mistake. So really, truly only invest a really, really small percent at a time um, relative to however much money you have. And just hang on, hang on, bro. Because I promise you, if you can I talk about $10,000 like it's not a lot of money. I realize it's a lot of money to people. If you can work up, let's say 10 grand, if you can save 10 grand and even use that in DCA into crypto, even that, bro, like you'll walk away with like 40, 50, 60, and that'll be life changing for you. So it doesn't matter. Like it's the, the percentage gains here are all, it's the same across the board. So it'll be life changing money for every single person based on how much you invest, whatever you can do. But do that, get your life in order. Step one, okay, get your, get your effing life in order. Make more money, save up, and then as that bubble, as your bank account keeps growing, just keep adding more into that position and just and just freaking hold on to the rocket ship. Yeah, Pretty simple. Cool. Like Point on, simple. yeah. Yeah, yeah, super simple. Cool. I think that's good. We're going to let you go four minutes early here. Is there anything else you would want to tell people about before we wrap this up? If not, you can carry us out through the outro. Outro. Um... Let me think if there's anything. What what kind of viewers do you guys mostly have? Is it crypto? Is it like? Uh, it's Web3, obviously, focused in terms of like, that's why we talk about crypto, but it's a mix. Like we're getting a good mix of obviously Web3, mindset, entrepreneurship. Like, I mean, I showed you our top five channels. Our viewers are coming from you, Iman, Jordan, uh, Luke Belmar, and Ari. Yeah, I would just say, yeah, and I have until about, I have another call at 12. So I'll just say, I'll just say this real, real quick. Um, it's a difficult journey and it's going to take a long time. But in my, in my personal view, in my personal way that I look at it, you don't really have an option. I feel like you kind of just have to do it. Um, and it's well, 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 well worth it. So, I mean, every, every successful person is just a, 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 a combination of all of their failures and a lot of people like to to look at successful people and think that they're different. They're different, like, you know, they have a, a, the secret or they have a secret sauce or they're just genius and they have something that you don't. I'm guilty of this as well. Um, but the honest, the God honest truth is that every single successful person is learning what they're doing as they're going. They're constantly failing and they're just, they're not, they keep going. So successful people are just professional failures. Like they just keep going. And, and that's how it is. And even the mess, even the most, experienced most expert person in any industry is still learning there we're all on this train where we're learning uh how to do what we're doing better and constantly fail not constantly but always failing and always continuing to improve um and so that's i think the really the difference there so if you if you do want to do it just expect that because i think people just be like okay i'm a failure now but then i'll be successful and i won't fail like no 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 it's always failure it's always failure and always like linear slow ride up so just expect that and if it happens don't stop don't stop because of that and then and then keep going because you have to get to the other side and it's well worth it so i'd say that and then um i just want to say thank you guys for inviting me and i, I really enjoyed this conversation i i probably we could probably talk for a couple more hours honestly but um i really enjoyed it and uh yeah again thank you so much i appreciate it Absolutely. Thanks, Thanks for hopping on. I still owe you a weekend in Miami. So I know when you get here, <laughs> you know who's here. Okay. I'll, I'll hold you to that. All right. I got you. Sounds good. Thank you all for tuning in. Make sure you check out Seb. Let's get him to 600K with our 600 uh, and counting subscribers here. And uh, yeah, we'll see you guys on the next episode. Peace out. Later. Peace.